minutes after two, sorry for the delay. Uh, hello and a very warm welcome to the second day of our symposium, How Do We Live Tomorrow? New Ways to Social Housing in Europe. I hope you all can hear me. Um, this is Johannes Luther, Urban Innovation Vienna, together with my colleague Bernadett Luger. We will also chair you to this second afternoon of our symposium. Um, for those who have not followed us yesterday, just a very short wrap up and a few explanatory uh, um, remarks. Um, it also gives time to all our participants to get online. We're still expecting a few. Um, this symposium is part of the program of the International Building Exhibition EBA Vienna that is celebrating its interim presentation year this year with a series of events, guided tours and other activities. And we are happy that uh, this is also the kickoff of our partnership um, of a network of cities that um, together with Vienna um, join forces to um, organize an exchange on housing issues. The idea was that, that the building exhibition, the international exhibi in building exhibition here in Vienna should not also be international in a way that it's presenting its results to a global audience, but also wants to uh, engage in an international discourse through this network and uh, although we would have been happy to welcome you here in Vienna we are happy to have you at least uh, on the screens and um, a, a particular warm welcome to Andreas Hofer and his team from the IBA Stuttgart who, will, um, who are joining us today and of course like, like yesterday a warm welcome to all our participants here in Vienna who are following us on, on their screens. Um, a few technical remarks, um, as you perhaps have heard at two o'clock sharp, it's very good if you um, mute your microphones as long as you're not speaking, otherwise we always have some technical interferences. A second uh, remark to all our speakers, uh, one of the learnings from yesterday is that um, our web connection is kind of stressed by the high number of participants. So if you um, um, click you through your uh, PowerPoint presentations, please be patient. It, it will take uh, one or two seconds until you see the next slide. Don't click it a second time, otherwise you will swap one slide, just one after the other. Um, Final of my housekeeping remarks, we uh, should inform you that this session is recorded. We have an audiovisual record running uh, of this session um, for documentary reasons. And also we have a graphic recorder. Um, perhaps you have seen at two o'clock the, the recordings from yesterday. We will also integrate this into the documentation of, of this event. Yesterday afternoon, we have been asked um, about this documentation. Yes, of course, we will share uh, a documentation of this event with you after the event. Um, this would probably have the form of the brochure. This is still to be decided. Uh, and there might also be uh, the possibility to share this, this recording uh, with you. There are still one or two data protection issues to be solved, but we'll keep you posted on that and you will in any way get a documentation of, of this event. So let's look, uh, take a look on, on today's program. Um, the key issue of today is climate adaptation and sustainability in housing. Um, the session will follow the same format uh, like yesterday. So we will have a short introduction of the topic with a few examples from IBA Vienna provided by Kurt Hofstetter, the coordinator of, of the IBA team in Vienna, uh, followed by a short interview where we, will, where we will reflect on the topic and, and on the examples. Then we are looking forward to the presentation from our partner cities, followed by a round of discussion. And compared to yesterday, this will on, only be one topic session today, but uh, afterwards, and this is also a highlight for today, we will have a keynote presentation by Karin zauner lohmeyer uh, on the European Citizens Initiative Housing for All. Uh, yesterday we have talked a lot about um, the, the human right to housing and to a good standard of living and this initiative is trying to address this topic from at a European level. 
So that's the point where I hand over to our actual host, the host of IBA Vienna, the IBA Vienna and, and this meeting today, the coordinator of IBA Vienna, Kurt Hofstetter. Kurt, are you there? Hello. Hello, thank you, Johannes and Bernadette for the introduction. I think I could directly jump into uh, the introduction for our third session if Elias is ready for that. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, because yesterday, I don't know who else, who uh, who started a little earlier and connected a little earlier. I could see uh, Lana Lawrence graphic recording from yesterday. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we talked about uh, neighborhood development and affordability and new forms of housing. But we do not only want to talk, but prepare showcases together in various cities. Uh, to be shown as stepping stones for uh, into the future of housing, especially into the future of social housing. So I'm very happy uh, that uh, another EBA uh, Stuttgart with Andreas Hofer is uh, part of our discussion today, because I think uh, what especially what we are discussing today really leads into the future, and we don't have too much time uh, to change a lot, and uh, it might need more than one EBA uh, to to really. Uh, work with that. So uh, I just want to give a brief uh, introduction in which kinds of projects uh, we have in Ibo Vienna around the topic of climate adaption and sustainability, which is the session three for today. Uh, one of the bigger projects is Biotop City Wienerberg. Uh, it's quite a, it's a neighborhood development. Uh, that was kind of in the idea started by Harry Glück and Helga Fassbinder from Biotop City uh, uh, Foundation in the Netherlands. And they managed to bring this idea uh, to the ground and to invite the developers so that they could build a consortium together with the city planning department of uh, Vienna. So there was a an urban planning agreement made in the beginning, uh, quite some intense process, and all the developers really decided to make something special, something new, uh, although it's only a part of this building is uh, subsidized or funded housing, and the rest is uh, private market housing. Uh, so they were working on a quality booklet together with architect Liner very intensely, and when we looked at that, uh, in the beginning, they were not even part of, uh, of Eva Vienna, they just uh, developed it. And we looked at it and said, this, you are exactly doing what we're looking for in, in, in the Eva. So please, uh, let's uh, go into contact and, and look at it uh, more, in more in detail. That's why we brought out this brochure you can see here, Hidden Treasures. Because what they are doing uh, will not be visible in the end, not on the first uh, glimpse. What you will see is very high buildings very densely built, uh, but also very green. And uh, this is what they tried to show how you can combine very dense buildings and uh, a green city. Uh, one of the very interesting parts is uh, the green pass modulation. So this is a, a kind of new uh, modulation system on the computer, on the master plan level, where you can uh, find out which kind of green measures will be uh, really effective and which are not uh, in a very early stage. So that, that helps the developers to uh, put their money on the right spot in the right time in the right way. Uh, the goal is that the air that's going into the area uh, will come out two degrees cooler than it's going in. That's very interesting. We are looking uh, at the results and we are looking forward to see the results very soon uh, in a few years when, when really it starts to, to work and to function. Uh, but this modulation now, meanwhile, has already found place in other developments in the city. So it's really uh, growing and we're really trying to use this as one as the planning tools uh, because it helps us to define the right measures and to save the money and to put the money that is needed in the beginning uh, to, the, uh, to the right and, and effect, most effective places. So you can see here just three pictures on the left uh, without greenery in the middle is 
what in fact was uh, the result of the thinking process and on the right side is the maximum uh, what you could do uh, and the uh, in fact the uh, difference is about two degrees so this is the between blue and red it's about two two point five degrees this is what is the aim for uh, the city and there's a lot of measures that that are working together and coming together uh, it's a different kind of way of sponge city planning it's a very different way of uh, parking park planning when you look at the new built parks you wouldn't think that are new built ones uh, you think it's a wild grown area and it's really unusual for uh, city development and for city park planning for example <coughs> sorry so what we can see is that uh the learnings from biotop city which is under development already and the first first houses are already uh, handed over to people where, while the others are still under construction so there's a few years gap between uh, biotop city and uh, quartier and the chance uh, we can see the pictures here there was a lot of learning process and and taking results from uh, experiences from Biotop City into the next development that just has started now. So that's really nice to see. <clears throat> that, sorry. I try. Uh, it's nice, nice, <clears throat> nice to see. Sorry. Uh, that within the city it really works that we can learn from each other and and develop that. Okay. <clears throat> so i would like to go further but it doesn't work yeah now it works uh the next one is uh Kati am Seebogen. we talked about it yesterday a little here we have the sponge city system, not uh, all over the place like it is in Biotop City, uh, but it's more on the public roads and uh, on the system of uh, of traffic traffic areas. So that's a more technical solution than, and and a different uh, approach, but it includes all of the of the neighborhood and. Uh, for the city, it's interesting to try it out also for the city administration. So they really want to know if that works and how it works. Uh, so that can be uh, developed further for bigger parts of the city. We have a huge school with uh, component activation, soil sensors, extra costs, uh, with amortization time of only five years. That's interesting. So this also has changed a lot. Usually this was a much longer time until this money comes back. There is, of course, there is more investment in the beginning, but it comes back within five years and that's interesting. So this is the first school in Vienna that is doing this. And we are very much looking forward to have results and experience from that because that could be a really big rollout. Uh, we can see then another project where it's done in social housing in the same way, even more radical. And also there you can see that uh, that it's just working and it really saves a lot of money. So the coordination of ground floor uses is a bit main issue, of course, around the topics of health, sports, activity, and they are working together. We talked about that yesterday. Then there are some single projects uh, that help to bring uh, green facades into the grown city, which is usually not easy because the pavements are very small. And, and a lot of car parking and things like that. So there was uh, the development of Berta, uh, for example, one system uh, that is completely uh, worked out in a kind of one-stop principle. So nobody has to deal with uh, uh, regulations anymore. It's all done. You can just uh, apply. You can uh, get it more or less ready. And it's also subsidized by the city. This was uh, a great cooperation uh, with the Department for uh, Environmental uh, Protection. And uh, I think Jürgen Price will then talk maybe a little about that. 
some projects about CO2 reduction, energy efficiency, and also recycling management. Uh, so Wild Rebengas, it's the picture on the left, uh, was the first developers uh, competition in Vienna that was uh, asking for only timber construction and uh, completely renewable uh, heating systems. So this is more or less the same uh, as the school that's above, uh, I talk, uh, that's below, I talked about uh, in the Seestadt Aspen. And then we have Vivi House, the little picture in the middle, it's just uh, under construction now, it's completely uh, timber construction and self-made by 130 students. They, they did everything themselves and, and also uh, are erecting it themselves, it's also interesting. So many projects uh, on this level that are really showing what is possible, but what we still can see, and this is the, still what we usually do in the, in the main uh, scale, is full concrete. This is also an EBA project from Aspen Seestadt. Full concrete production, full thermal insulation. This is still what we're doing. And when we talk about uh, 20 years until we want to be CO2 neutral, uh, that's far too long. We need to be much quicker and come to uh, other solutions much quicker. So that's why I'm happy that we also have another EBA there, because I know that Andreas Hofer is very uh, active in this topic and we will have to uh, just push each other, uh, not just between EVAs, but between cities and developments, to, and also help each other uh, to gain ex, uh, experience and to bring it into uh, realization very quickly. So thank you. This was my short introduction to the topic. And sorry for my <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Thank you for your introduction that illustrates very well the wide range of projects uh, that are being realized in the course of IBA Vienna from small scale single interventions in the existing buildings to implementing a holistic approach by using all kinds of planning tools in a very early stage. For answering the question, how do we have to build tomorrow? And for a brief reflection on Vienna's position on climate adaption and sustainability, um, we have invited Jürgen Preis. Jürgen, hello, can you hear us? Yes, thanks. It's great to be there. Um, I mean, it would be great to be there. <laughs> um, I can hear you perfectly. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, I have attended some EBA exhibitions in the last days or last week. There was a session, it was really great. Unfortunately, I have to switch to another conference uh, in an hour, so I'm a bit stressed, so I hope uh, you don't need me for more than 15 minutes. Um, Jürgen, we will try to keep the schedule. Um, thank Bye. you so much for being here. I would like to shortly introduce you for our audience. Uh, Jürgen is Senior Deputy in the area of Spatial Development of the Vienna Environmental Protection Department, and he is, among many other things, playing a leading role in the Vienna strategic strategic plan on urban heat islands, as well as on the program to promote the implementation of the greening of buildings. So thank you very much for being here and I will get straight to the questions. Um, every subsidized residential construction project in Vienna, as we have learned yesterday, um, is submitted to an interdisciplinary jury, which evaluates the project on the basis of the four um, pillar model which consists out of economy, ecology, architectural standards and um, social values. So the ecology pillar ensures high standards. I'm hearing, could you, Jürgen, do you have your microphone still on? Maybe you can. Yes, yes, I'm on. Um, so, uh, the ecological pillar ensures high standards in energy efficiency and ecological construction, as we all know. So what about the aspects that are important for climate change? Are these aspects already covered by the criteria? Or more precisely, which criteria would we need in order to consider climate change adaption in housing projects? Um, well, uh, first of all, um, I think it's absolutely great um, to have the ecological pillar in the evaluation process. 
um, I would say um, as part of the of the housing subsidy, um, green infrastructure like uh, green roofs, facades, also de-sealing measures are taken into account. Um, so these are absolute positive aspects um, of climate change adaptation. Um, second, um, well, there is the question what measures are taken with regard to housing besides besides the housing subsidies um, like thermal renovation. Um, um, I would say there are um, four very important um, measures. Um, first of all, and that's something what we are actually doing is uh, information work. So it's um, a lot of things we've done in the last um, years, like they, um, you have already told, and um, and Kurt, uh, we have worked out the urban heat island strategy plan, uh, it's 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 that one also available in English language. I don't know if you can see it. It's uh, possible to, to down, download download it from our homepage. A um, lot of other guidelines on uh, green facades, green roofs. Um, then it's very important to um, to share the ideas, the knowledge. So um, uh, departments um, have started with integrative programs like. Uh, like the infrastructural adaptation to climate change, um, lots of um, specific projects like the green building project. Um, and um, one important part um, concerning information work is uh, consulting service. Um, there are different services like Umweltberatung, local agendas, um, then there is a really expert um, office, um, it's the Innovationslabor Grünstadt Grau, uh, which is funded uh, by um, the Bundesministerium. So that's the first important uh, thing. The second one is research work, and uh, this already has um, this also has been mentioned already. So, like the project 50 Green Buildings uh, was a funded project with an um, excellent team working together. So um, we need external experts from universities, from um, um, from other offices um, to cooperate uh, the, with them on specific questions. Um, other projects are Green Resilient City Project um, or the Urbania Project. Um, why is this important? Because uh, green blue infrastructure and the effectiveness on the urban climate, how can we use them? How can we value them? Um, what tools do we need? Um, this is something quite new, so it's under development. Um, we have to test a lot of things. We have to investigate how it works. So that, that was the second very important thing. Um, the third one is, um, I would say, money, of course. <laughs> um, if there is no money, there is no no green, or not that much, or not like we like to have it. So there have been a lot of funding in the last years um, offered um, these um, grants for private building owners, for instance. So our department um, has uh, has um, funds for uh, greening roofs, for green facades, up to 20,000 euro for a green roof or 5,200 for a green facade. So this is for private building owners, um, also offices. They can get funded for it. Um, also, districts got um, an extensive financial package, um, like cooler Bezirk or cool streets. This is also very important because uh, usually districts or some districts uh, cannot really afford to um, retrofit the public open space schools uh, with that screen, uh, what we like. So it starts with the problem, how can we finance more trees in uh, streets? How can we green up schools, um, municipal um, uh, um, office buildings and so on? So um, at the fourth point, very, just very short, is the legislative framework. So um, the, we end up building the regulation, I would say. But do you want to add some question? Thank you very much. You have answered already a couple of questions that I have prepared for you. Maybe you can switch off your mic while I am speaking, otherwise we are... Uh, 
I think my colleague has just done it for you. Thank you very much. You have answered many very interesting questions I would have prepared for you. Uh, there are two topics I would like to have a follow-up question. Uh, first is effectiveness and secondly cost. Um, concerning effectiveness of these measures, are there already any, is there any experience already? How effective are which measurements? That would be my first question. And secondly, um, concerning costs, we are speaking about affordable housing, housing that is payable for residents. Um, how did this, how does this go together with making, uh, buildings climate adaptable? Doesn't it mean to invest more money in order to have sustainable and resilient buildings? And what are your experiences on this effectiveness and cost? in the context of affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, I'll switch it on again. I hope you can hear me now. Um, yes, there is uh, plenty of knowledge already about um, the effectiveness of um, single messages, measures. Um, it depends on if you're speaking about measures in the open space or measures uh, on the buildings themselves, there's a bit of difference. Um, well, we can measure the measures <laughs> with temperature sensors, with thermal cameras. Um, we have carried out a lot of um, measurements on sites so or temperatures under trees in waste structured green spaces. What's the difference? So, what's the effective? Uh, a minus of uh, 10 to 3 to 10 degrees uh, throughout possibly if you have uh, street spaces uh, with no green at all, absolutely sealed compared with um, um, well green uh, green um, courtyard so you, you can have uh, quite differences differences by that um, especially if we speak about surface temperatures um, differences can be very high up to 50 degrees so you have can have uh, 80 degrees hot surfaces um, these, these temperatures high temperatures are not uncommon. Um, very important um, to be noticed that uh, the physiological temperature is uh, a very important uh, parameter which uh, is uh, used uh, with modeling work with microclimate simulation. So the, the PET, the, um, that's the temperature what um, humans can uh, perceive. That's the um, a sort of human biometeorological parameter that describes the thermal perception of an individual. Um, that's very important to think about that when using microclimate simulation tools. So um, it was already shown at the great project Biotop City. Um, at, at that project, um, the, the Green Pass certification tool was used um, to find out how um, how are the measures? So we have worst case scenario, we have a planning scenario, and then you improve it. Um, and um, these tools, these microclimate simulation tools, show you how the measures influence uh, the temperature. So the temperature, the inlet temperature, which which comes from outside, and the outlet temperature, and uh, especially at Biotop City, um, it was shown that um, a difference of of three degrees um, compared to the bad scenario um, could be achieved. So, and, and three degrees is quite a lot. Uh, it's, uh, speaking about um, urban heat islands, uh, the mean typical urban urban heat island uh, is is the diff is a difference of temperature of temperature of, of three degrees uh, in the inner, inner city parts and in the surrounding of the city. So you can achieve quite a lot, uh, minus three to seven degrees reduction of inside temperature also on buildings. Um, but it's a bit complicated because um, th th this is something um, very specifically under process um, needs a lot of uh, scientific work still. Um, you have to calculate what's happening in the surrounding and how it influences the building inside. It needs a good um, interface work. But um, it's uh, well known that um, shading with, with plants and shading elements and also other measures um, um, using high albedo at the building's orientation is very important. So um, where are the, how big are the windows and so on. So you can reduce actually inside temperatures up to seven degrees. Um, yes, um, the MA48, for instance, is a good example. Um, with the green facade, um, the heat transmission from outside to inside of the building 
um, has been reduced uh, more than 50% on hot summer days. That's quite a lot. Thank you very much, Jürgen. I see there are many topics we could still continue to, to discuss about this. Um, I would like to bring in our... Could you put for your, down your microphone? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Thank you for being here. Uh, we've almost managed uh, 2.30. I'm just taking a look at the clock. Thank you very much. Uh, we could have continued uh, with the interview, um, but I would now like to bring in the international perspective of our guest cities. Jürgen, you're very welcome to stay with us as long as possible for you. We're also having a discussion, uh, a more deeper discussion after the impulse lectures. But for now, I would like to welcome today's Stuttgart uh, uh, speakers from our partner cities, Stuttgart, Dublin and Berlin. Due to our tight time schedule, I kindly ask the speakers to respect the given time frame of roughly 10 minutes uh, per impulse. Um, and one more hint again for the speakers, uh, as my colleague Johannes has mentioned before, please be patient. Um, our internet connection um, has a delay of around one to two seconds whenever you press on the presentation, but the next slide will come up for sure. And again, the audience, um, you're very welcome to write your questions or answers to the topic in the chat function that you see next to the tool and we will try in the discussion afterwards to uh, take in all your questions and comments and answer them together with the partner cities. Uh, so for now, um, finally, please welcome um, Andreas Hofer, our speaker from Stuttgart. He is the director of IBA 27 Stuttgart and today he's presenting Challenged by Climate Change and Energy Transition Welcome, Andreas Hofer. Can you hear us? Okay, nice. Thank you. Uh, I work since more than two years now here in Stuttgart on IBA 27. These are very long projects, but we are still at the beginning. Uh, what is interesting is that we can really generally discuss the topic here in quite a big scale. We are a regional project and the Stuttgart region is challenged by climate change. It is one, as a region, one of the, of the uh, uh, most influenced regions by, uh, by temperature rise. Uh, the, it's a, a heat island as a region. So this is one of the, of the general topics of, uh, of our project. I cannot show you uh, built uh, uh, buildings, but uh, I can show you the strategy we take uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to contribute the next years uh, to a more sustainable future. Now I try to switch to the next one. The the reason for uh, EBA is uh, taking place here in Stuttgart is the centenary of Weissenhof. Uh, architects uh, know this uh, estate that was built in 1927. And what is uh, really interesting that the architects who built Weissenhof discussed quite comparable topics uh, nearly 100 years ago. So it was all about affordable housing, modern housing, uh, comfortable housing, and doing this by using new technologies, new materials, uh, uh, new engineering strategies. Naturally, something has changed uh, since then, but for us, it's a reference point to be, be try to start. We are broadening the view uh, in the Stuttgart region. This is a kind of panorama from Weissenhof, and it is one of the most productive, also very rich and very dense uh, European regions. There is still much industry around. You uh, surely know uh, Mercedes and Porsche. They are produced here. They are naturally also one of the sources of the problems we have. But all these industries are actually in a, in a very challenging uh, finding of new strategies also in their production processes. So it's uh, uh, quite interesting. It's not just a passive role. It's from the production side also a very active role the Stuttgart region will play in the next years uh, in engineering, in uh, environmental technologies, in also new mobility solutions. 
Uh, we started the project uh, uh, defining se several level levels of uh, of contribution. Uh, we now for two years are just collecting ideas on a kind of a platform. So we are we are uh, building up a network of initiatives of sites of university projects also. And uh, out of this uh, uh, broad uh, collection of ideas and concepts, we try to uh, uh, to evolve uh, uh, projects and neighborhoods. Neighborhood is a, is a very important uh, topic of our work. We try to bring together functions. We try to bring together high density and diversity in quite big projects. And on the way to this 27 big event, uh, we are experimenting with universities, with temporary buildings, with lightweight structures here in the region. And we call this the e -bar festivals the first of these festivals will take place in two years in 23. We defined uh, uh, quite a high profile for uh, for for our e quarters, so uh, or neighborhoods. Uh, they have to have a certain size, a certain density, a certain complexity, and we are actually preparing uh, about twenty international competitions uh, for such EBA neighborhoods here in the region. We are working also with many institutions in the sustainability field. In Germany, it's DGMB, the German Network for Sustainable Building, that is defining with us the quality for the EBA projects. There is quite a big response. Uh, this here is an example of uh, one of our biggest projects in Bucknang, 18 hectares of formal industrial site. And there were 110 applications from architects worldwide just to contribute their ideas in this competition that is at the moment running. This is a, a map of the region. It's uh, also very complex institutional-wise. It's 179 different towns here in the region, 2.8 million people who are living and working here. And you see the black dots. So uh, our project uh, is uh, really a, a network, a regional network, and not only the, the city in the middle, the city of Stuttgart is playing a role here. So we can uh, uh, test uh, strategies on, I would not say rural, but uh, a metropolitan level from mid-sized towns to the to the to the central town of Stuttgart with more than six hundred thousand inhabitants. Uh, after two years of, uh, of collecting, of discussing, we defined five uh, topics that, uh, uh, that, uh, are, uh, our, that, that define the questions and the challenges here in the region. First is the productive city, and I mentioned it, it's really in a very complex role of production of industrial history, but also industrial future. And uh, we are working with uh, with companies here in the region, and there are sites, it goes from really hard uh, uh, production also to urban agriculture, to, to, uh, to uh, environmental qualities in this traditional, on this traditional factory sites. So it's not a post-industrial development, it's really an industrial development. Here, this is an example uh, in the competition I mentioned uh, in the Bucknam area. Second topic is the future of centrality, uh, quite uh, also influenced by the corona history now. Uh, there is a complete change of the function of, uh, of uh, city cores and also the the, uh, the ground floors of city centers, uh, what is the city of the retail? Can we use cities completely in a different way as places of meeting and gathering, also reducing mobility? Which brings us to the third topic, places of moving and meeting, how the transportation system can be uh, 
changed that that, that the, the knots uh, in this uh, metropolitan railway system mainly uh, are more attractive and are places where you not just uh, change the different transportation modes, but perhaps you stay there in new centers of co-working and uh, also uh, uh, common activities. Uh, here we are really in the environmental issue. Uh, we have uh, a, an industrial river that flows through the region, which is, uh, you still cannot swim in there. There is still uh, some industrial use. And we try on the regional level to uh, improve accessibility to the river and the landscape and to use this blue-green infrastructure also to improve environmental quality here in still maintaining and keeping uh, the, the river as a transport infrastructure, which is still quite important. Uh, this is the last and fifth topic, uh, how we deal with the modern heritage. Uh, this is one source of the problems we have, but naturally we cannot just eradicate this. We have to transform the existing city and the existing also infrastructure into sustainable and future-proof uh, buildings. There is much of the stuff around here. This is uh, an example of a, of a university campus that will be uh, left over in three years. And we are trying to experiment with materials, with uh, energy strategies, also with, uh, uh, with water flows to transform this uh, university campus in the mixed use areas in the next years. So uh, these are just the topics we are working on. And uh, the, the, the climate question, this is very interesting, is really, is really a, 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 daily, a daily discussion with the people here around. Uh, we sign contracts with our project partners where CO2 neutrality and contribution to microclimatic improvements are, uh, are one of the of the big issues and i'm quite astonished that is it's not a discussion here it's really a a common and general search of uh, of a completely different uh, urban development and uh, uh, cases mentioned uh, wood construction uh, new also energy production uh, hydrogen economy are are completely present in our discussion in our discussions now. I hope this could inspire you to uh, do also uh, 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 strategies that are so uh, integral and uh, and uh, uh, future oriented in your cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, thank you for your insight to, to Eva Stuttgart. We are exciting to see your Eva growing um, concerning the topic of transformation of buildings from the 60s and 70s, for sure, in the discussion. Afterwards, we will come back to that topic. Um, thank you very much, Andreas. For now, I would like to uh, welcome our next guest speaker from Dublin. We've already heard yesterday from Dublin uh, that E.T. Downey was presenting yesterday. Today, we're welcoming Ali Graham. She is city architect at the city of Dublin, and her impulse lecture is on renovate or demolish and rebuild, exploring regeneration options for Dominic Street West Housing Estate for optimal environmental and social sustainability. Please welcome Ali. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Great. Um, okay, you're going to put my presentation on the screen, but just before we start, I would just that was a uh, um, very inspiring comment by Andreas that uh, climate action is a daily conversation in Stuttgart. I don't think it's a daily conversation in Dublin, unfortunately, but we hopefully will get there. My colleague is working on the presentation. 
OK, well, I'll just um, I suppose I will start the presentation just speaking to it uh, so that we don't lose too much time. The um, just to say, I mean, the policy context. Is. Oh, hang on a second. Sorry, I have to see what my instructions are here. Do I have control? Yes, you're ready to go. OK. Um, so. How do I push? How do I press on the? Is it just like a normal PowerPoint? No. You just have to, the... just you have to click with the mouse on the on the PDF and then you. You get to the next. Ha, here we are. OK, thank you. Um, OK, the policy context very quickly is yes, Dublin has a climate action plan. Uh, it was published last year. Uh, we're a member of the Covenant, uh, a signatory of the Covenant of Mayors. We obviously are applying all the EU legislation. Uh, we are aware of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we are aware of uh, and, and are incorporating all the relevant policy uh, in, our, in our construction programme and other work. I suppose in terms of climate impact on Dublin, the uh, big issue is actually um, rainfall. Uh, heavy, heavy rainfall and having to slow down the water before it gets to our very old drainage system. Uh, obviously, flooding is an issue along the coast. We're a coastal city and in uh, along some of the rivers, we will have a heat, uh, heat island effect to, to deal with. And uh, I suppose we also have the issue of energy poverty. In terms of uh, my section, City Architects' work, I mean, we do have a great overview across the work of the City Council in that we deal with, uh, we are architects, we design buildings, we work with great arch consultant architects who also design buildings, we engage with the community, we work on public realm projects, uh, we are concerned with heritage, which is really a, um, a heritage is an issue that I'm going to talk about in this presentation design uh, thinking about design and design thinking is important for us and obviously sustainability so design thinking and sustainability i think uh, are the two pillars of all our work um what i want to talk to you is about this big question we have about uh demol demolition or renovation of buildings because it's a very difficult decision uh, for dublin city council to have to take so obviously, as Dahi explained, my colleague Dahi explained yesterday, there is a an affordability issue in Dublin. There's a, um, we have a housing shortage. Uh, Dublin City Council itself owns about twenty six thousand homes. Uh, about sixteen thousand of those are in flats or apartments. Uh, many of them are quite old, and there are maintenance issues, and uh, so we have to go and and repair them. And so we've prepared a list of about 30 estates where we are looking, uh, we're trying to decide whether it is better to just uh, rehouse the tenants, demolish the estate and, and redevelop, or whether we need to uh, renovate. So that's a big question. And in order to, I suppose, progress uh, an answer, try and find an evidence-based uh, answer to that question, we have just decided to do a study along, uh, along a street called Dominic Street, and uh, which is very close to the city centre. So what you're looking at is uh, in white uh, is a particular one side of Dominic Street it was an estate built in the 1960s and 70s. The estate uh, in White was built in the 70s, slightly older. All of those buildings have since been demolished and there's a new construction happening at the moment. In red, we have three blocks still standing and they are mostly vacated, but the remaining residents are going to move into the new development across the road. So the plan is at the moment to demolish those three blocks for various reasons. Um, it's to do with the quality of the, the flats, the fact that there has been a bit of maintenance work done in the past, it hasn't really worked, it hasn't brought the buildings up to standard. 
uh, there is a perception issue that the flats are redundant and really if you were if we're going to build good quality homes we need to demolish them and start again but we just want to really test that uh, assumption and i suppose dominic street just to, to talk about the background the the particular this particular estate has had kind of ideas and has uh, thrown at it before um we have uh, it was the subject of what we call a public-private partnership back before the uh, global economic crash. Now, unfortunately, that, that public-private partnership contract uh, um, fell. So the redevelopment, the regeneration of the Dominic Street estate uh, was uh, put on hold. We did an ideas competition, which we called Dublin House, which was to look at maybe using the site when it, when it came to be regenerated as a self-build cooperative development uh, using the pattern of the uh, previous houses that had occupied the site before we demolished those to build our, our, our flat complex. Uh, so that was the Dublin House competition. We did a master plan ourselves in City Architects for how we could redevelop the estate. We then demolished the east side uh, and uh, in order to uh, prepare it for redevelopment and there was a very interesting temporary meanwhile use on that site, which was called Granby, Granby Park, which uh, uh, I suppose generated a lot of public interest. And now we're looking as we as we complete the redevelopment of Dominic Street East, which you can see an image here. It's going to be a fantastic development and all the tenants from the west side will move in here. We're looking to see what we do for Dominic Street West. So we thought what about, uh, I suppose, an opportunity study where we look at the embodied carbon of these blocks? Because I suppose it is important, I think, to always question our decisions and assumptions about buildings. Uh, yes, this, uh, uh, there are reputational issues going on here. Yes, the estate on the west side has struggled. I mean, you can see an image here in the middle of boarded up flats. Uh, some of the flats are below standard, they're too small. Um, but really, one thing we, we are just not asking ourselves, not one question we're not asking ourselves in Dublin is, what is the cost of the embodied carbon in these buildings? Is it, is it a case that we can assume that it's more sustainable to just demolish and build new near zero energy building buildings and that's the best thing to do? I mean, added to this, Dublin has over 50 blocks similar to the Dominic Street West blocks, and they contain about 1,500 flats. So if we, the decision we make here as to whether, whether we renovate or demolish would actually um, be inform all the other similar flats. Now, the study is, I, I suppose, not quite complete, but what it has established is that uh, the materials in the building uh, account for 80 percent of co2 and uh, also i suppose the embodied carbon in the three blocks amounts to nearly two million kilograms of co2 uh, equivalent so that's quite uh that's quite chunky so what we've done is we've uh we've we looked at different options and just at theoretical options design um loosely designed to say what, well, if we could just measure the embodied carbon and uh, of various options and uh, do a life cycle assessment, uh, would that help us decide what in terms of carbon cost is the most efficient way to go? The two options we've studied in most detail is a deep retrofit option of the existing blocks, uh, similar to, I think, to a development uh, project that was done in Bordeaux by Lacaton and Vassal. And the other option was to do a hybrid development of where we retain one block and we demolish the other two and we build new. Anyway, the preliminary results show that the retrofit option produces 12% of CO2 uh, of the, uh, the option that would demolish and build. Hmm, seem to be going backwards now. Sorry, my fault. Um, okay, that's that's very interesting. However, 
Um, we have other issues and I thought your question um, to the introductory speaker about effectiveness and cost um, is relevant here. Um, we have done deep retrofit on other uh, on other projects. We did a, a wonderful um, deep retrofit project on an estate called Dolphin House, um, where we did uh, phase one was 100 homes, where we deep retrofit. We deep retrofit 63 of the apartments and we built 37 uh, new apartments. And um, unfortunately, the cost of the deep retrofit was considered to be roughly equivalent of constructing new apartments, plus the tenants, the residents in the Dolphin House estate preferred the new apartments. And uh, so they, we not only had to contend with criticism of our retrofit apartments from residents who were looking at the lovely new build apartments and saying, why can't we have those? Um, when it came to our paymasters, the Department of Housing, they said, well, you're, you're spending as much money deep retrofitting. So I suppose that just brings me to the end of the presentation. I mean, what the hope is for Dominic Street. Um, I suppose what I'd like is a bit more jo joined up thinking um, at a policy level in Ireland and in Dublin that we actually start to count the cost of carbon and include it in our cost benefit assessments and our evaluation processes. We're not, we're not doing that at the moment. Um, and uh, we also have other, I suppose, strategic issues to deal with. For example, we've done a, we've done a, um, I suppose, a survey of all our projects to see how, how well we're faring in terms of climate action um, measures uh, incorporated into those apartments. And a challenge across the programme is really that the green procurement is still in its infancy. So we can't actually specify components that we know work. We have to just give performance, uh, an overall performance indicator. But if, some, if, if a product is extremely innovative, we can't actually specify it because by definition, it is innovative. Therefore, there is only one of it, but we cannot specify it. Um, so the second thing is funding restrictions. The Department of Climate Action has issued a circular, it did that last year, to say we should really be um, incorporating more green uh, measures into our buildings, but only if they um, meet existing cost constraints. But unfortunately, existing cost constraints don't allow for ongoing use. They just allow for construction costs. So there's a bit of a catch-22 going on in there. Uh, another problem is the use of um, engineered timber isn't permitted in buildings over four stories for fire safety reasons. So our, the option we've studied, which is uh, for Dominic Street West, which is to build a new building in engineered timber, wouldn't, won't actually be possible to do anyway. And um, design and build is increasing, increasingly, I suppose, the flavor of the month, which limits our, I suppose, um, specification options even more. So I suppose that, so where we, we sit at the moment is only about 10% of our estate regeneration proposals do allow for uh, deep retrofit. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Ali, for this very inspiring uh, lecture, especially as the question, what is better for the climate renovating or new construction is uh, concerning all of us. And we will get back to that uh, topic later during our discussion. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, for now, I would like to welcome our last guest speaker of the day. Um, Manfred Kühne, he was already um, holding a lecture yesterday during our session in the afternoon. Uh, Manfred Kühne is head of the Department of Urban Development and Projects in uh, the Senate Department for Urban Development and Housing in Berlin. And today he will give an impulse on uh, Berlin Schumacher Quartier and Linnerstraße, uh, which is a project, um, a residential building project made of wood. Welcome, Manfred Kühne. Thank you for being here. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I hope uh, I'm heard too. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Yeah. Yes, um, now we will have again um, a changing scale in the project. 
I want to present, and I hope it does work, yes. I want to present um, one of the most ambition, uh, transformation, ambitious transformation projects in Berlin. Um, we waited for a long time to see the closure of the uh, inner city airport of Tegel. And now, to our very surprise, uh, we, it will happen at the end of this year. We, so we had many, many years of preparing uh, the development of this site of uh, about 500 hectares. It's even uh, bigger than the site of uh, the closed Tempelhof airport uh, in the inner city. And now we are facing the challenge how to bring together all the ambitions uh, about uh, concerning climate adaption aspects and resilience aspect to uh, the, uh, the budget and the financing of uh, the construction um, of new uh, quarters here. In the overview, you can see um, uh, we have a, a development scheme that is uh, representing the dream of the uh, of the reindustrialization of the city of Berlin. Once one of the industrial powerhouses uh, on the globe that lost almost its entire uh, industrial capacity in the critical catastrophes of 20th century. And uh, only in the eastern part of the site, um, there will be a housing development. Uh, with an, uh, on an um, area of 48 hectares. In the center, the, the terminal building will be transformed into a university campus. And that is meant to be the nucleus of this development, like we practiced it before very successfully at uh, the former jo uh, Johannistar Airport that is known as uh, Germany's biggest technology park, uh, almost finished in Adlershof. We started with a team uh, that came from Adlershof that uh, brought a lot of experience how to, uh, to manage the planning process. And now uh, from the next year on, we are starting to uh, prepare the first constructions. Um, it's a very, um, uh, it's a very important um, uh, transformation area because in the entire west of uh, uh, the, uh, the city of Berlin, we have uh, after the, um, uh, the end of uh, civil air traffic, we will have major investments. For example, the uh, Siemens company will revitalize its a traditional uh, campus of Siemensstadt and also many, many housing uh, projects in the surrounding will be possible when um, the, po uh, um, the noise um, will be gone with uh, air traffic. We had the time uh, to consider all the aspects that are relevant for uh, um, uh, climate adaptive and resilient um, urban uh, development. I don't think that I have to explain uh, these issues. You all are, have them um, in focus. And we have the time to um, um, for competitions and design processes for the creation of a, a residential area for about uh, five thousand uh, residential units and about 10,000 future residents with all the uh, infrastructure that is needed for that and also with a, co a, a small commercial center. And so we um, have a, a very, uh, a very um, uh, a concrete uh, vision, what we want to create there. We also um, finished a process uh, for the uh, elaboration uh, of a charter uh, that is fixing all the development uh, and quality aspects um, for the um, future um, uh, residential uh, 
um, quarter. But um, we are very much challenged because in the last uh, 50 years uh, since uh, the planning process started, um, we had um, a complete inversion in the uh, political um, um, the political um, conditions of the development. We started in a phase when, after 2001, when the city of Berlin was in a budget crisis similar, similar to that of uh, Greece, Spain, or Italy uh, after 2008. And in the beginning, uh, we had the expectation that there would be a complete sellout process that we would have to uh, to sell all properties uh, to private investors and that we would need uh, political and legal instruments to um, to steer this private investors towards our ambitions for climate adaption and resilience and after 2010 we experienced that um, uh, after a very, very hard phase of austerity, the, the, the city budget of Berlin was not only balanced, but we had a surplus of some hundred millions every year. And we restarted for the first time since the 1920s um, with a huge um, uh, invest, investment uh, program for the uh, in order to retrofit all the degraded uh, infrastructure in Berlin and to fund new um, investments like here in Tegel. This new uh, real estate policy uh, that had uh, the aim to get control again over um, a, a large part of the real estate market in Berlin for example, by uh, buying all the, the premises of, the, of this airport site from the federal government was combined with a completely new strategy in, in affordable housing. Since that time, city-owned companies uh, have to uh, create as many new flats uh, as they can as fast as possible. And 50% of these new um, apartments have to um, um, have to be subsidized uh, with the aim to reach um, um, a, a rental level of six euro fifty per square meter, um, and that's also uh, the friendly condition here. At, uh, at Tegel Airport in the Schumacher uh, quarter. And uh, the other half of uh, the housing units will be uh, financed and constructed by private investors uh, that are, uh, that will have uh, uh, mandatory regulations to create 30% of formal um, housing units. Uh, to the same rental conditions that the city owned companies have to uh, respect. So we now are looking for um, the partners um, uh, among the city owned, uh, uh, the municipal housing uh, associations, and also among, among cooperatives and uh, private investors. And it's a strange situation that we have fixed the planning schemes uh, for our development without the future uh, partners responsible for the investment and uh, the management of uh, this quarter. So we have now to negotiate how to finance, for example, our uh, mobility hubs. Um, we want to reduce car traffic uh, uh, in the Schumacher Quarter as much as possible. We have to discuss with the city parliament if the uh, uh, corona crisis, uh, the corona uh, budget crisis is affecting our investment for the ecological standards of the public spaces. 
Um, you can see we've we finished already every detail uh, uh, for it uh, in the expectation that the city of Berlin would be able to fund all that. And of course, uh, we have to, um, to uh, negotiate if there can be additional funding for special aspects that animal uh, aided design uh, that is not only uh, in the future mandatory for special areas like uh, this uh, transformation side, but will also be uh, in the future mandatory by a changement of the local um, building permit legislation. Um, so we know what we want, and we have a lot of support in the um, planning community and also in the uh, city parliament to uh, start with this development. But uh, in contrast to many, many other um, uh, major development areas in Berlin, we don't have yet uh, finished the negotiations to bring together uh, the wide range of funding from the EU level, uh, from the national level and the local level, and to make the contracts with uh, the future uh, investors and the future owners uh, of the buildings and the apartments. In this context, it's very important for us to um, to uh, increase the awareness that in uh, small projects, in decentralized uh, developments in Berlin, we, uh, we have learned a lot how um, to deal with uh, the, um, the cleavage between uh, climate and resilience uh, amb ambitions and uh, the financing of um, uh, projects. That's why um, we start uh, special programs, for example, in the sector of uh, 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 timber constructions. Um, here we, um, we created a um, uh, timber construction award uh, for projects uh, uh, already constructed in the city of Berlin in the last decade. We had 53 entrants uh, in this competition, and we now can show a wide range um, of modest and more ambitious uh, projects that have already uh, uh, been finished, and they uh, can be uh, landmark projects also for the municipal uh, companies and uh, the other investors that we uh, uh, will invite uh, to become partners in the development of the Tegel Airport site. And for example, this is one of the awarded uh, time of timber construction uh, building recently uh, finished in Berlin. I don't want to go into details, um, but um, for us, these existing projects that are, were not um, that were not started and supported by the city of Berlin that uh, are the result of uh, the uh, cooperative landscape, the self-organizing landscape among architects and nonprofit investors in Berlin are for us the most convincing partners uh, for uh, the programming of our large development sites like in Tegel Airport. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot to, to uh, all the three of you. These were really uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Um, they showed the, the whole spectrum from retrofitting to new construction. Um, and I would like to start with a question to Ellie, just for my understanding. Um, when reaching your decisions about uh, whether to, to demolish and, and, and newly construction on something or renovate the existing stock, um, did I understand correctly that you consider the whole uh, carbon and material footprint so so even the, the gray energy that would be needed for for new construct new construction 
compared to energy savings, for example, that you would have uh, with, with, uh, in, a, in a new building? Well, we don't, the point is we don't consider it at the moment. Okay. It's, not, it's not part of the decision making. So that's why I suppose what we are doing, the little study in Dominic Street West is, is actually asking that question. But, uh, but what we would want to do, if we, in, in any retrofit, we would want to bring it up to near zero energy standard. So the, it would be the equivalent in terms of energy performance as a new build. But there are just, the, the key issue in Dublin is, is nothing to do with energy, is nothing to do with climate action. It's to do with additionality. Can we get more homes? That, that is the overriding uh, question. And I suppose that's why it would be good to get to a point where we also factor in embodied carbon. We do not factor it in at the moment. I see. Um, and, and, and using your, your model, um, what's, what's, the, um, what's the result in, in, in uh, what percentage of, of buildings would you reach the decision to demolish or to retrofit currently? Well, at the moment, as I said, we are doing, we have done an audit of, uh, put a, a, together a priority list of 30 estates and we are of the projects that we currently have approval to proceed with, which I think uh, is six estates, we are only looking at uh, renovating one. And the reason, and the reason we are renovating that one is because, well, I, I think we, we wanted to, we want to renovate it, but demolishing it and building a new block would actually get no additionality. I see. Um, the difficulty for the Dominic Street West site is it is it is it is literally in the city centre. It is in practically inside in the retail quarter, and there would be uh, and it's a very valid uh, perspective. Uh, the question is: Is the site more valuable to the city council? And like any uh, as a public body, we are short of money. Uh, is it more valuable to the city council to dispose of it? That's a, also a, a, you know, that's also a question, an option would and, and use the money to finance other projects. That's a very valid uh, um, option um, because it is a very si centrally located site. So, uh, so I suppose just really what and um, what say our partners in the Irish Green Building Council would be very interested in is promoting the idea of just counting the cost of carbon. And uh, anyway. May I ask you, is this part of, of your research you're doing or you're doing a study uh, just to find out how much uh, carbon is, is kind of uh, captured in the building and how, how much are the costs? You're doing this research now to, to prepare the ground for a proper discussion about it or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Just, just. However, we have got preliminary costs in, and uh, in terms of construction, like the, the the capital cost of doing the work, and and our the initial uh, advice is that, well, it is actually going to be a very. It's it's almost as expensive to retrofit, and uh, as to demolish and build new. I think those costs have to be tested a bit. But we are at a, at a I know it, it might seem um, it you guys might be well ahead of this, you know, well ahead of us on this, but uh, we are at a, a sort of an earlier stage in Ireland in terms of asking these questions. I, I guess um, I'm sorry, I, I believe that, that that kind of model is in any way interesting for us it, it, I, because it seems quite comprehensive and I don't think that we have such a kind of comprehensive calculation model. So, yeah, so we were looking forward to, to sharing this with you when it's, when it's ready. And there are other issues. I mean, I couldn't go into it. Uh, there are uh, questions of identity. There's questions of us um, and how we look at public housing in, in Dublin. I mean, these are stigmatized blocks. They, these are, they tend to be quite distinctive looking. So they are clearly identifiable as social housing. There was a lot of discussion yesterday, very interesting discussion about uh, making, you know, ensuring that developments are tenure blind, that nobody, you know. That, right. Uh, so it's, it's, all, it's all very interesting, but I, and also what I found very interesting yesterday in the discussion were, comments about which i think are, are certainly the case in dublin 
The fact is new construct, new public housing is of far superior quality than that which is developed in the private, you know, privately developed buildings, speculatively, speculatively developed housing is of poorer quality. So the, uh, it is, it is all quite, you know, that the fact is, I think that, uh, that these, um, 1960s flat blocks, which have been, um, slightly stigmatized in the recent past would actually probably, if they were retrofitted far exceed in terms of quality, what might be available in the private sector. Could one, do you want to, uh, to, uh, add something to that? Because yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add when, uh, Alec Graham said, uh, you might be ahead of, of uh, maybe Johannes, could you switch off your microphone? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, this is exactly why we are doing this and, and coming together uh, to kind of support each other. When, when I saw yesterday Tahiti and I know last year's events, uh, like uh, referring to Vienna uh, as, a, as a model, so even if we are, you might think we are ahead, we are not, in, in, especially in this topic. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do uh, like what Lacaton Vassal did in Bordeaux, for example. Uh, we wouldn't have the same need because we always did something in little steps. Uh, but at the same time, this radical uh, kind of change and, and, and refurbishment, we couldn't do it here as well. But it's good to bring together the discussion and to support each other. And, and that might help also on a, on a level of political decisions then uh, to be more courageous and to do a step uh, ahead. That's that's the reason why we do this. Uh, one issue that always uh, one answer to the question of additionality uh, in the in the existing building stock is of course densification, an issue that also Andreas I think uh, addressed in his presentation. Um, the um, the question of of densification in the existing stock uh, I believe is not only one of how to, to add to the existing buildings, but also how to um, add to the existing surrounding infrastructures, which means green space, uh, social infrastructure, um, retail and, and all of that. Andreas, do you have solutions to this? Because this seems to be a quite um, a hard problem um, in, in already kind of um, uh, inner city uh, areas. Uh the problem actually is that uh, regarding uh, person density, we are still de-densifying our metropolitan regions. The increasing uh, uh, space consumption uh, in housing reduces the, the, the personal density. So I think if we address carbon footprint and real density, then we have to talk about who owns the buildings. So, for instance, the carbon calculation depends massively on the lifespan we calculate for our buildings. And we are discussing more sustainable ownership models, which I think would be cooperative. And we are discussing completely different life cycle uh, uh, cost assessments. So we are talking about houses that will last for 200 or 300 years. This is a research we are doing, actually. This would completely change the initial cost calculations and also the, 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 the carbon footprint of the housing sector. And we are discussing models of how we can stimulate uh, sharing and changing activities in the housing sector. So uh, there's a big issue here of people who are living in single family houses on 160 square meters alone or two of the kids moved out. You cannot change this if you stick with the traditional home ownership uh, uh, methods that are uh, usual in, in our city. So we, we have to go into much more fluid markets in more massive and durable houses.
Thank you. There was one last question to the to the issue of, of calculating uh, from from our audience um, to Ali, uh, and she's asking, well, how is the increasing shortage of building material like sand, for example, considered in the calculation and and, and decision making between retrofitting and and building new uh, houses? So <laughs> this kind of material footprint also uh, in, included. Oh, it, it is, but unfortunately, I am not. <laughs> we'll have to take that question offline. I am not an expert, Dan. I'm not an expert at that level. Um, the uh, apologies. Uh, sure, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be either. Thank you. <laughs> um, you were addressing the the question of uh, stigmatization. So, who, who, would you would you know from the building who's living in that? Uh, on a more general level, on the on the neighborhood level, what we can see in in analysis in current analysis is that uh, climate analysis maps are in many cases matching the social vulner vulnerability maps. So, uh, those people. Um, who are who can only afford cheap housing always live in the areas that are in danger of uh, particular um, urban heat islands and this is my question uh, to to all of you are, are you facing uh, the issue of climate segregation and would it make sense to to focus all this this question of climate sensitive measures like the the greenhouses project um that that could uh, introduced at the very beginning to those neighborhoods where you have this matching of vulnerability and and overheating Perhaps could the question to you. I think it's not a um, not by accident that the first fifty housing are in inner favoriten, which is one of those dense areas where we have heat plus vulnerability uh, in in one area. Right. So it started there, and it's called fifty greenhouses, which is not fifty houses yet. Uh, it's, it's 50 uh, uh, containers where you can grow uh, green, uh, plants for green facades. So 15, 50 units. Now it has, uh, rolled, has been rolled out over the city because it was uh, successful in the beginning. And many people asked, why can't we do this in the 16th district, in the 15th, in the 17th, where, where all this uh, kind of more than 100 year old uh, uh, Parts of, of the city are kind of showing the same uh, the same frame and, and the same conditions. So now it's rolled out over the city and it's it's, it's uh, kind of made accessible for every house owner. It's for house owners mainly uh, because they can get the uh, the subsidies and they can then uh, be supported to do it until it's rolling on and until people see how how to work with it and that it's easy in fact and that it's working. Perhaps I'd like to address this question also to the, to the other cities. Do you see the danger of, of climate segregation? That there are that there are neighborhoods that are in, in particular need for climate sensitive uh, measures like cooling, greening, um, all all those issues. Um, will I will I answer? The uh, I'll, just to say it's yes we have done we have done a, a study. Uh, back in, I think, 2016, um, 17, a report was done which did identify that some, that there were clear areas of energy poverty. You know, we matched unemployment rates with the quality of the housing stock with the, you know, the energy performance of the housing stock and found that there were very clear uh, areas of potential energy poverty. But the, um, and a lot of them in the suburbs, in the inner suburbs, actually, but the, I think uh, it's, I, I th and I think a lot of people spoke about this yesterday, and and in fact some of the other presentations today that uh, that actually there's a uh, urban living is and inner city living is inherently sustainable. So while the people might be living in in homes that are not very energy efficient, they're in in how they live they are uh, living more sustainably whereas it is ironic a lot of our more energy efficient homes are in the outer suburbs where people have two or three or four cars 
and they drive everywhere so they aren't living sustainably so it's a it's a it's a total picture that has to be you know we have to grasp it's not uh i think and and i some and people mentioned uh covid coronavirus the problem for urban living in in dublin say is that people have uh, very little um very poor access to amenity space and uh, and that is actually um almost a bigger problem uh, than i think the energy performance of their buildings so thank you i i see on the list of participants who are locked in uh, that we have also Cologne on, uh, on board, so, so just feel invited to, to join into the debate whenever you like. Uh, if, if uh, there maybe are... I can add something from the Berlin perspective. Sure. Uh, in Berlin, we have a, a special situation because um, uh, of the heavy post war dis uh, war destructions and post war demolitions, and all the existing inner city areas with a very high density were uh, urban renewal areas in the 1980s in the West and in the 1990s in the East. So uh, uh, green facades, green courtyards, green roofs, uh, that was funded in Berlin in the 1980s and 1990s uh, by uh, the European Union and the federal government. But anyway, we have something like a climate rebellion in the inner city, and we have it in the um, post-war modernist housing estates, for example, east of Alexanderplatz, the area with the highest amount of greenery in the inner city. And uh, the people there are very well organized politically, and they don't accept uh, a densification strategy. Um, and it's very strange because these housing estates belong, uh, in, in most cases, uh, municipal uh, housing companies. And uh, the people insist to, um, to uh, the conservation of huge parking lots in front of their uh, windows. Um, but uh, we have intensive participation and cooperation and discussion processes and we have to bring uh, better, uh, uh, we have to, to bring noise reduction strategies to bring new kinds of mobility to convince them to give up their uh, established uh, parking lots uh, in the estates. And we think it will take four or five years to negotiate that. Uh, so we have something like a climate rebellion, but not in the high density areas. It's a little bit uh, strange. I see exactly what you mean. Uh, the, uh, we know that problem from Vienna, and, and uh, it's a very tricky thing to convince inhabitants that there are benefits coming from densification and not only um, uh, making things uh, worse than they are or, or, or losing what, what they have. Um, I would like to, to, to switch a bit from, from uh, the existing housing stock to, to new housing construction. Um, what we have seen uh, from the examples from, from our cities, but also from, from the IBA Vienna, is that uh, we have learned a lot in, in the recent years about um, all questions of um, climate sensitive building and, and plot design. So, starting from the, from the ideal positioning and orientation of buildings, passive cooling, greening of facades and, and roofs, uh, rainwater management, and, and stuff like that. Um, I think it was cool to raise the question how we will how we will be how will we build tomorrow? So um, is this still uh, are we still on a level of, of pilot projects or, or are we already in a stage to, to integrate those new methods into our standard procedures? For example, for Vienna that would mean to integrate the, the, those things as criteria into our housing developers competitions. Um, Perhaps, Kurt, do you want to start? I think the question answers itself, more or less. Of course, we need to implement uh, this huge amount of, of our experience we have and we are co still collecting into the standards. So 
That's why I showed this uh, developer competition uh, of Waldraben Gassi, where for the first time it was possible uh, to do that in a competition and to make sure it's timber wood construction, uh, what you have to bring, otherwise you will not be able to participate even. And I think this is the way we are, have to go forward. I don't know how much uh, wood resources we will have, and, and we know exactly, uh, because we, we also looked at it, if we would have developed uh, the current phase of Seestadt Aspen, just uh, 2,000 flats or 1,500, they're now under construction, all in Timberwood, we wouldn't have the companies to, to provide it. Uh, so, of course, this is a, 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 a process that's going on, and the industry is really not ready to do it on a big scale, but we have to help them and to enforce uh, more or less the, the circumstances. Uh, and then it will be will go very quickly, I'm sure. Um, uh, Andreas, you have mentioned uh, contracts with your developers um, where you um, f force them to reach a certain CO2 effect. Um, is this just a, a, a contract where you where you um, fix the the outcome, or do you also negotiate with them on on the way how to reach that? <laughs> A good question. Uh, I think we reach normality when we can abolish all these energy regulations and standards and uh, labels uh, when CO2 neutrality and sustainability is just common sense and common production technology. So I think we are on the way. We are. We did quite uh, quite good steps. But we try to to uh, to bring this into a normal mode of production, and we also uh, discuss with this German DGNB uh, Sustainability Board whether we can discuss more about uh, ways than standards. So. Uh, if I reach CO2 neutrality, it's uh, it's not really important whether I do this with high insulation values or do, or with a, with a very clever energy production system. So I think this must be the the goal to just have a, a neutral housing stock, and then there will be some different strategies to get there. We are much talking about. Uh, uh, bringing down technique in, in the house. So no heating is one aim we have, no water in the house, no, no tubes, no pipes. Uh, get rid of this stuff, get back to a very low tech, very rough structure, uh, because it's also an environmental issue that all this technique has a lifespan of 15 years, 20 years, and the, the, the shell, is uh, is much more robust. So we we try to to uh, have a higher percentage of long time uh, stuff in our houses and to reduce this uh, this very short time uh, things. For instance, smart city is not an issue for us. We think we should get rid of this uh, of the houses and of the cities and to have more robust, more resilient structures. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to, to all of you for this very interesting debate that I'm uh, looking forward to, to deepen also in, in the, the upcoming weeks and months. Um, uh, in particular, the term of smart city, uh, just a remark to Andreas Hofer is, of course, something that, that it is defined differently in Vienna, but we could, could talk more about that later on. Um, at that time, I would like to hand over to Bernadette uh, again for our next next topic in our agenda. Thank you, Johannes. Um, thank you for the discussion. Uh, at last, we'll return to one of the core topics of, of IBA Vienna, namely the right to housing. Uh, at the same time, we've heard yesterday and today that cities throughout Europe face a housing shortage, rising rents and escalating real estate speculation. To counteract this, Karin zauner lohmeyer launched the Euro European Citizens Initiative Housing for All, together with like-minded people from all over Europe. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Karin zauner lohmeyer who is a forester by training, journalist and graduated publicist, 
and has been working in the Vienna City Administration for 18 years. Welcome, Karin, and thank you for being here. Karin, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, the presentation is ready for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you for the invitation, Bernadette. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you today. Um, yeah, my name is Karin Sauner lohmeyer I am from Vienna and I am an ordinary European citizen. I have been dealing with housing since I, I'm 10 years old. Housing in an overcrowded household, housing in a boarding school, looking for a flat, renting a flat, renovating the flat. And today I'm also dealing with housing. Um, as Bernadette mentioned, I work in the municipal housing sector in Vienna. And in my job, I got the opportunity to attend a lot of conferences in Europe. And soon I realized that there is something uh, seriously wrong in Europe's housing market. So I decided to make a difference. And today um, I would like to tell you uh, that I'm absolutely convinced that housing has to be a public responsibility and why we need a fundamental change also in European policy making. First of all, I would like to give you a short overview of what I'm talking about. Um, first, I would like to describe Europe's housing crisis and the reasons. Then I would like to tell you what's a new, what is a European citizen initiative and what needs to be changed. And the last point of my presentation, of course, is the point next steps. Yeah, Europe is facing um, an alarming housing crisis. Next slide, please. Uh, what we already know is that housing is too expensive. More and more people can't afford housing anymore. 53 million Europeans are overburdened by housing costs. That means that they uh, spend more than 40% of their income on housing. And as a result, the purchasing power is decreasing due to high housing costs and the stagnation of incomes and pensions. Yeah. Um, there is an enormous lack of affordable housing, especially in the growing cities in Europe. And people who keep the cities running, like nurses, like teachers, police officers, civil servants, all these people have to live, have to leave the cities and to commute long distances to their work of place. Yeah, and the number of homeless people is growing rapidly in almost all member states and also airbnb and other short-term rental platforms are reducing the local housing stocks for the residents for the citizens and as a result we have ghost city districts with a lot of empty apartments and what are the reasons for the housing crisis um, next slide, please. The main reasons are policy of deregulation. It is a market failure in the housing market. The fact that the capital market will never provide affordable and adequate housing for broad groups of society. So um, we need state intervention and housing has to be a public responsibility. I think Vienna is the best practice example for this concept. Yeah, um, and the European framework, especially the financial framework, restricts uh, the ability of cities and member states to invest in social and public housing. And the result is also there is a lack of public investments in affordable and social housing. The investment gap is estimated by the European Commission to be 75 billion euros per year. That's incredible. But the main reason for um, the absolutely alarming housing crisis is of course the speculation in property. Housing is, has become a safe investment 
Housing is a very attractive store of wealth. It's a place to park money, and housing is more and more seen as a commodity than a human right. Next slide, please. Yeah, I just want to give you one graph in my presentation. This is the house price index. It shows the annual rate of change um, and captures the price changes of all residential properties purchased by households and existing, both existing and new ones. And as I said, the increase in house prices is much greater than, the, than in incomes and pensions in almost all member states. Yeah, so housing is a human right. And my home is not the cash cow. Next slide. So now what is a European citizen initiative? Next slide, please. It is an official instrument of participation in the European Union. The organizer is a citizen committee. That means um, seven citizens living in seven different member states. And the ECI has to address an issue of the legal competence of the European Union. Um, you have to collect one million signatures and in seven member states, a certain threshold given by the European Commission. So it is super demanding. And if you are successful, uh, your demands must be heard and dealt with the European Commission and the European Parliament. But what's the catch? Um, there is no binding obligation for the European Union to implement your demands. So it is a super weak instrument, to be honest. And I'm sure that I would say business lobbyists, they don't need one million signature to get an appointment with representatives of the European Commission or with um, MEP. So yeah, I think it's a little bit unfair. And here you see the minimum numbers of signatures uh, you have to collect. As I said, in seven member states, you have to meet these thresholds. And there are so many obstacles for the organizers, since um, there are different requirements uh, for collecting signatures. In Austria, it is super difficult because you need your passport or your personal ID, and many people don't have their passport with them. So it's not really easy to collect signatures on, signatures on the street. Germany, you don't need any passport, so it's quite much easier. Yeah, it's really a demanding uh, requirement. Next slide, please. So, yeah, um, maybe you're asking why did I get involved? Yeah, to me, it seemed that we spent a lot of time in, on discussing problems. Uh, at conferences without discussing, discussing together um, policy, uh, to the, discussing together solutions with European policymakers. And what, what, we, what we think need to be changed is European legislation for more affordable public and social housing in Europe. Um, next slide, please. We have to change first the people's access to social and affordable housing in Europe. We have to change the mastery criteria for financing affordable and social housing, the EU funding regulations for public and social housing, the business practices of short term rental platforms, and also how Eurostat collects data on the housing situation from a national to a more local, a regional based model. Slide, please. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the ECI is a weak instrument and absolutely unsuitable tool for getting citizens' voices heard, but it is it can serve as a door opener and we defined four goals. Um, we, our ECI uh, wanted to increase uh, visibility of Europe's housing crisis and raising awareness for the right to housing, 
influencing the media discourse and also connecting uh, the challenges, the issues of housing with European policy making. We created an, a Europe-wide network of like-minded persons and organizations. And um, I had the opportunity to talk with decision makers in Brussels to contribute, of course, to solutions. Next slide. Yeah, so it was all about the journey. And we did so many photos and postings. Here you can see um, the mayor of Vienna, Mr. Ludwig, or or also the MEPs in Strasbourg. Um, next slide. Yeah, and we had in many member states held press conferences. Here you can see Austria. Next slide. Germany. Next France and, and Malta. And then Cyprus and also in Dublin. We had a press conference. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and we had a quite good media coverage, of course, uh, also in the of course, Germans, uh, German speaking countries. Next slide. Yeah. And across all ages and across all layers of society, we have created a network with representatives of trade unions, tenants associations, social associations, human rights uh, associations, also pensioners, student associations, and tenants networks, non-profit housing providers, celebrities, um, politicians, private activists, and also with right to the city movements from 23 countries. And yeah, I, as I mentioned, I had the opportunity, I got the opportunity to talk with decision makers here. Um, I also talked with uh, the vice president of the European Parliament, Mr. Uh, Otmar Karas, and I said to him, um, we need solutions uh, since the reasons for the crisis are very closely related to the European legislation. And um, it, was, it was funny, he said to me, please stop collecting signatures, you look so tired. <laughs> and, um, and he said, it's much more important that you are here now and talk with me. So I think he also knows um, that the ECI is not really a very um, good instrument for changing uh, policies. Yeah, and the absolutely highlight, please. Next slide. Was the housing for all event in the European Parliament. Um, we were invited by the European Greens um, to the European Parliament. They organized together with the left party and the Social Democrats an um, absolutely super event called Housing for All in the European Parliament. And I got the opportunity to present the ECI, to present the demands. And I said, we have voted for you and we expect solutions. We are the citizens of Europe. Um, I think this event is also the proof that the housing issues have reached the European level, the European institutions, and um, is now, I would say, really high on the agenda, uh, also because of, of course, the problematic of the climate change and, and in, in combination with the Green Deal. Yeah, the next slide. Yeah, and now there is an initiative report from the European Parliament on the way. Um, the rapporteur is Kim van Sparentag. She's from the Netherlands, from the Greens. And the draft report was presented in the Committee of Employment and Social Affairs on the 31st of August. And on the 1st of December, there will be the vote in this committee on this report. Yeah, and we as an initiative has uh, agreed with the MEPs to continue, of course, our dialogue. Please, next slide. And in February, yeah, we had to stop the ECI because of uh, changes in the regulation of the ECI and uh, due to the Brexit. Um, yeah, it was super complicated and bureaucratic. Uh, and we decided to stop the ECI. The statements of support of the UK citizens would have been only consider, considered by the Commission 
if they had been reviewed and certified before the withdrawal date, 31st of January, and we couldn't meet this requirement, so we decided to stop, to stop it in February because we have reached our goals. We were in the European Parliament, we, we brought the housing crisis and our demands to um, Brussels, and we are really proud that we, we had the uh, opportunity to contribute to this initiative report, and all our demands are in this report. So, um, yeah, the last point is now, of course, what is next? Please uh, give me next slide. Yeah. For any of you who know me already, they know that it doesn't stop here. The next logical step in, is creating a European Housing Awareness Network. This network is called Housing for Europe, and today is the, the day of launching this network, so it is now online. And our aim is collecting, verifying and sharing information, especially from four different perspectives, because we have recognized that it needs these four different perspectives to find solutions, from the citizen side, from the housing developers, also for the from the economic side. We shouldn't forget this uh, important perspective from the local politician, the, the mayors, and also from the European institutions. So these four perspectives are um, on, in focus of our platform. Yeah. And I invite you now, of course, to join the network by clicking uh, join us on the website um, and subscribe to the newsletter. Yeah, and if you're looking for facts, figures or statements or uh, opinions, housing best practices, go on, check out the latest news. Um, and if you may all be interested to sending us content or content sources, drop us a line and we will be happy to get in contact with you. Yeah, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd say thank you for listening. And don't forget, it's not the end of the journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karin Zauner, um, for this very inspiring presentation and, and, and for the enormous amount of, uh, of efforts that you have invested in, in this initiative, which seems quite impressive to me. Um, Kurt, you wanted to, to add to this. Yeah, I, I want to thank Karin and to congratulate her as well, because uh, I think it's important to understand this is not an initiative of the city of Vienna, this is an initiative of a citizen of Europe. Uh, and you can see how far you can get if you really don't give up, if you collect your energies. This is uh, coming, from, of course, coming from Vienna and from this tradition and from knowing how important it is. This is why I mentioned it yesterday twice uh, for the Housing for All. Uh, and I, I am really happy I invited Karin to uh, take this opportunity because I think this is why we are all doing this, uh, bringing the topic of uh, the importance of social housing onto the European level, because all the cities know about it, but the nations do not know it so well, and we really need to bring this uh, into mind that it's not a uh, discussion of competition, it's a discussion of dignity uh, and of human rights. So thank you, Karin, and uh, I invite all the others to support this. <laughs> and uh, it is not, <laughs> it's not an end, it's the beginning. Thank you. Yes, it's the start. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, may I just, just ask you uh, one question? Do you already see um, impacts of, of your work on, on, the, on the one hand on the uh, level of policy discourse, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the other hand on the level of uh, concrete measures, like, like you said, regulatory uh, measures at, at European level? Um, yes, yes, I see here an really important impact because um, this initiative uh, was a kind of, I would say, platform uh, where three different political parties in the European Parliament had, uh, I would say, um, a kind of um, um, reason 
to um, to go together and to um, to start talking, thinking about the housing crisis and about uh, measures and solutions. And these like-minded uh, MEPs are now really in, in contact and they have informal meetings talking about the housing crisis. And we, we that means also my colleagues and, and I, are in a, in a contact with the MEPs. I had today and also a call with one MEP from Barcelona, Ernest Urtason. Yeah, and as you said, it is really, or Kurt said, um, it is an, an issue of the mayors of the cities. And we have identified, of course, that cities are not really included in policy making, enough included. Um, so um, I think the housing issues can also change a little bit the perspective um, on policy making um, and cities and the contribution of cities. Um, yeah, um, also the MEPs, um, they also see that this is not the end of the story, it is much more a, a start. This initiative report, I have really, uh, I'm very hopeful in that this report will increase the pressure on the European Commission. And we have with uh, Nicolas Schmidt from Luxembourg, um, a very committed person uh, to social housing. That's super. Yeah. And I'm sure that our initiative had really important, gave important impulses to um, the European institutions and they are all in contact with me. And I think this is also a proof that it's important, a to important topic and they like our movement. <laughs> okay, so, so, so it's also a, a, a platform to, to generally give uh, cities a stronger voice at the European level, which I think is uh, very important. Uh, are there any questions to Karin from, from uh, other cities, from, from the audience just? Raise your hands or your voices. <laughs> okay, if this is not the case for the moment, then thanks again for, for, for joining us and for the presentation. Thank you very much. It was really an honor for me to be part of the IBA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is the moment where we um, come to the end of our official part of, of the symposium. Uh, I would like to thank again all our speakers from today and all our partner, partner cities for, for joining us. Also, thanks to, to all our participants uh, at home who contributed the, the questions also uh, via chat function. And of course, to our graphic recorder, you, I can see her on one of my uh, pictures on the screen. So you, we will provide you with this, uh, her results uh, very soon. Um, this is also the moment where I would like to um, thank our back office, which is really in, in the back of us. And <laughs> now, now you can see them. So um, who have helped us through all, uh, all our uh, technical difficulties. And um, we're happy that in, after all it worked out. Um, and I don't think that I've forgotten something. Just wanted to give uh, um, back to to Kurt and and uh, of course uh, thank you Kurt for for the very um, productive and decent cooperation with you and your team in the run up to this to this meeting. Yeah, thank you back, uh, Bernadette and uh, Johannes and your team in the background, and thank all the. Uh, the cities you have come together. I'm so happy that we could do it, even uh, if we could not meet in person, but we could meet uh, on screens. That's very helpful. And uh, together with the cities, we will meet again in a few minutes and, and talk about how we can go forward. But I'm also thanking uh, all the people who were uh, just joining in and listening. Uh, for me, it's the start of a, of a cooperation with other cities now this last contribution by Karin Zauner, uh, of course, it was the last one. It was uh, a very impulsive and you could see uh, also political topic. But in fact, that's the driving force uh, for everything we are doing. We're trying to prepare uh, conditions for people that are uh, 
not just modern, that are safe, that are sustainable, that are affordable. And uh, this is what all uh, binds us together. So I'm very look, much looking forward to uh, developing further projects that we can also, in two years, maybe when Eva Vienna is finished, uh, we not, do not only look at, Eva, at Vienna at that time, but also uh, at projects and processes in other cities so that uh, this European topic will be seen uh, and be visible. Thank you very much. Uh, I hand back to you. And uh, with the cities, we might uh, see each other in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, final remark for our cities, please stay uh, tuned, not in this uh, chat, but we will send you a separate link for our closed session uh, in a few minutes. And I would suggest that we meet again at half past four. And um, I hope to meet all the other participants from Vienna soon at, uh, at another meeting, uh, perhaps in the framework of IBA Vienna and perhaps even face to face. Thank you.